you mentioned the importance of sleep in preventing dementia. Is there a correct way to sleep? Should we be asleep by 10? How do we get enough oxygen while we're sleeping? How do you increase the oxygen saturation when you're sleeping? Yeah, it's a great point. And there's a wonderful book on sleep and all the aspects of sleep by an expert in this, uh, Professor Matthew Walker called Why We Sleep. The biggest thing, the biggest problem we see repeatedly is nocturnal hypoxia. And in fact, there's a nice paper showing literally as your oxygen goes down at night, you can show a direct correlation with the size of specific nuclei within the brain. So as your oxygenation is going down at night, your brain size is going down. We want to keep that oxygenation up 96 to 98 percent. For some people, that just means sleeping on your side. Uh, the main thing is find out what it is. Uh, for some people, that will mean CPAP. For some people, a simple dental device. Whatever it takes, you want to make sure that you have appropriate oxygenation while you're sleeping at night. But then there are all sorts of other issues. People waking up in the middle of the night, unable to go back to sleep. Some of those people, it's because they've gotten hypoglycemic and they don't know it. If you have a diet that is a relatively high carb diet, then what will happen is you often will spike your insulin. So you, you see these increases, then you'll see these troughs and people will wake up in the middle of the night, not realizing it's because their glucose is 45 or 50 and it's plummeted, which is also harmful. So I think one of the biggest advances <clears throat> has been these CGMs, continuous glucose monitoring. Very nice. And I recommend everyone, please check your oxygenation overnight. Easy to do. You can do it with an oximeter. You can do it with an Apple watch. You can do it with something called better. There are all sorts of ways, <clears throat> excuse me, to do this. And you can check it with your doctor, have your doctor loan you an oximeter. You can have them send you for a sleep study. Lots of ways to do that. Also though, check your glucose. What you'll find is there are certain foods you may not have recognized that are spiking your insulin and, and your glucose. And then there are others where you're now plummeting at night. You need to smooth this out and that you do that with a high good fats, intermediate protein, low carb diet. Some people even take uh, the, you know, shots of, of uh, extra virgin olive oil. Get that fat so that you now are stabilizing your, your glycemic load, stabilizing your glucose uh, while you're sleeping. And then there's all sorts of uh, sleep, uh, sleep hygiene, you know, turning down appropriate things early, get some blue blockers. Uh, don't be exposed to things that are keeping you going. You know, don't watch a scary horror movie right before you go to bed. There are all sorts of things. And again, we went through all of these uh, in the book, The End of Alzheimer's Program that just came out uh, in uh, August of 2020 uh, and actually worked with uh, someone who's doing this herself each day and doing very, very well. And this is uh, Julie Gregory, uh, the one who founded APOE4.info. So all these things, very helpful. Optimal sleep has been shown repeatedly to Im improve cognition and to reduce the risk for cognitive decline. In your book, The End of Alzheimer's, there was a chapter called Success and the Social Network, Two People's Daily Routines. Right. Please explain what this was about. Right. So my point there was that one of the most powerful things that's going to change our global burden of dementia is the social network. People are talking to each other now. Uh, I wrote this because I went to a meeting where a number of people from APOE4.info came to the meeting. They talked about going on our program and, and how they had improved things and what they were doing to optimize. And they shared secrets. Hey, you know, I, I didn't like this one, but this one was working better. Um, you know, by the way, I tried this form of curcumin, didn't work for me, but this form of curcumin did. The ability to share information globally and immediately is going to have a profound, and I think already is having a profound impact on our global health and our global burden of cognitive decline. So in that chapter, I also went through, here are two people and what they've done. One who was doing many, many things and doing very well. Another who wasn't doing so many, but was doing enough to get over the hump. There is a threshold, just as Dr. Dean Ornish showed years ago for cardiovascular disease. You have to get over a threshold. Again, synaptoblastic, synaptoclastic activity. Until you get to that appropriate point, you're not going to get a good outcome. But once you pass that, you're now seeing improved outcomes. So that was the idea for that chapter. Does stress, worry, constant daydreaming tax your brain and, and lead to dementia? 
Absolutely. And you can just take people and look at people who are under chronic stress and have high cortisol levels, their brains are shrunk. So we want to improve that. And by the way, we do see people increase their brain volumes when they do the right things. So you do have plasticity there. There's no question about it. Uh, and so absolutely. And in fact, uh, we have developed drugs over the years uh, looking in, in the laboratory and one of the things is that if you bind to a stress-related receptor called CRF receptor one, um, in fact, you have a positive impact. You, if you prevent that signal, you have a positive impact on both A, beta, and tau. So in fact, yeah, absolutely stress. And the whole kind of, it's not just insults, it's perception of insults. Those are, so they, they actually both give it, they give this pro Alzheimer effect on your brain. We're measuring these various insults like the various pathogens and inflammation, but threat is also uh, a, a, a something that is a pro Alzheimer's effect. So stress. Now, short periods of stress with resolution actually support it. This is a hormetic effect. It's the chronic unmitigated stress that is really damaging. <clears throat> Are there any studies showing that anesthesia or being put to sleep for a medical operation has an impact on dementia? Yes, many studies showing that uh, anesthesia use uh, is associated with a subsequent cognitive decline, unfortunately. And so again, we have a piece in the book that goes through, uh, if you're going to have to go uh, undergo general anesthesia, please hear of several things that you can do to uh, mitigate the problem. Uh, because we hear this story all the time, you know, so-and-so was doing well and then they had anesthesia and then over the next several months, they started to show some cognitive decline. You have multiple impacts from this. It is a toxin. So you've got to clear that toxin, therefore reduces your ability to clear other toxins that are already on board. Many people also have some hypoxia during their anesthesia. So yeah, for the multiple negative impacts of this. So if you can do it with local, uh, that's great. Uh, if you can't, you have to undergo general, it happens. Make sure that you get ready for it. And then you can also uh, do several things afterwards as well to give yourself better outcomes and lower your risk. 